the quest of Erebor. A story from the unfinished tales. Written by J.R.R. Tolkien. Edited by Christopher Tolkien. With music composed by Howard Shaw. Adapted, performed and produced by Bluefax. Long ago, Middle-earth was filled with many folk. Across the lands were families of men, living in numbers and building great cities. In the fair valleys and forests dwelt immortal elves of great wisdom and strength. And in the quiet land of the Shire, there lived a little people who preferred the simple life and the comforts of home. In the Third Age, there was an unlikely alliance between one of these hobbits and a company of the hardiest race of all. In the north of Middle-earth, the dwarves of Durin's folk prospered in the lonely mountain. Erebor. Deep beneath the earth they mined and tunneled, uncovering much gold and many precious things. They became rich and created huge halls and workshops, making things of wonder and beauty, and also weapons and armor of great worth. They had the friendship of all who lived near, especially the men of the neighboring town of Dale. And above all treasures shone the great jewel, the Arkenstone, the heart of the mountain. For long days there was feasting and song in the halls of Erebor, and the rumor of their wealth spread abroad until it reached the ears of the dragons in the north. At last, in the year 2770, Smaug the Golden, greatest of the dragons of his day, arose and without warning descended upon the lonely mountain in flame. Soon, all that realm was destroyed, and the town of Dale nearby was ruined and deserted. And Smaug took all the wealth of the dwarves for himself, and lay there in the great hall in the mountain, upon a bed of gold. From the sack and the burning, many of Durin's folk escaped. King Thror and his son Thrain escaped by a secret door in the side of the mountain. They went away south with their family and a small company of kinsmen and faithful followers into long and homeless wandering. Years afterwards, Thror, now old, poor and desperate, gave to his son Thrain the one great treasure he still possessed. The last of the seven rings of the dwarves. Then he went away, but did not say where. He was a little crazed perhaps with age and misfortune, and long brooding on the splendor of the dwarves' ancient kingdom of Moria in his forefathers' days. Or the ring, it may be was turning to evil now that its true master was awake, driving Thror to folly and destruction. With only one companion, he went north to Moria and walked proudly in as an heir that returns. But he did not emerge, for the kingdom was overridden with orcs, led by the great orc Azog, who killed him and branded his name on Thror's brow. Tidings were brought back to Thrain, who was maddened to a great fury and called upon his kindred from across Middle-earth to avenge this dishonor. There followed the war of the dwarves and the orcs, which was long and deadly, and ended in the great battle of Azamul Bizar before the east gate of Moria. There, Azog was slain and the dwarves earned the victory. But no feast. No song was there that night, 
for their dead who were beyond the count of grief. And despite the promise of treasure, none would enter Moria for fear of the terror that dwelt behind the shadow within. Durin's Bane. After Azanul Bizarre in the year 2799, the dwarves dispersed again to their own countries. Thryan and his son Thorin Oakenshield made a home in exile in the Ered Luin, the Blue Mountains in the west of Middle-earth. There, they forged mostly things of iron and prospered after a fashion, but of gold or any other precious metal they had little or none. It may have been in part due to the ring that Thryne, after some years, became restless and discontented. The lust for gold was ever in his mind. At last, when he could endure it no longer, he turned his thoughts to Erebor and resolved to go back there. He said nothing to Thorin of what was in his heart, but with Balin and Dwalin and a few others, he departed in the year 2841. While wandering in the lands east of Anduin, there came a dark night when he and his companions were driven by a black rain to shelter under the eaves of Mirkwood. In the morning, he was gone from the camp. His companions called him in vain and searched for him many days, until at last giving up hope, they departed and came at length back to Thorin. So Thorin Oakenshield became the heir of Durin. At 95 years, he was a great dwarf of proud bearing. He had no ring, and for that reason maybe, he seemed content to remain in the Blue Mountains in Eriador. There he labored long, and gained such wealth as he could, and his people were increased by many of the wandering folk of Durin that heard of his dwelling and came to him. Now they had fair halls in the mountains, and store of goods, and their days did not seem so hard though in their songs they spoke ever of the lonely mountain far away and the treasure and the bliss of the great hall in the light of the Arkenstone. The years lengthened. The embers in the heart of Thorin grew hot again as he brooded on the vengeance upon the dragon that he had inherited. He thought of weapons and armies and alliances as his great hammer rang in the forge. But the armies were dispersed, and the alliances broken, and the axes of his people were few. And a great anger without hope burned him as he smote the red iron on the anvil. At last, there came about by chance a meeting that changed all the fortunes of the House of Durin between Thorin Oakenshield and the wizard Gandalf the Grey. It was an evening in the middle of March 2941, some 170 years after Smaug's attack on Erebor, when Gandalf was found riding west through Eriador. He was tired, weighed down by the burden of Middle Earth. He was going to the Shire for a short rest, thinking that if he could put his troubles out of mind for a while, some way of dealing with them might be found. So it was indeed, though he was not allowed to put them from his mind. For just as he was nearing the town of Bree and paused by the road, he was overtaken by Thorin Oakenshield. Gandalf had not yet played any part in the fortunes of Durin's house, though he was a friend to those of goodwill, and liked well the exiles of Durin's folk who lived in the west. It was nevertheless to his surprise that Thorin Oakenshield actually asked him for advice, and it was at that moment that the tide began to turn, and it led to other and greater ends beside. Thorin was troubled too, burdened with the loss of the treasure of his forefathers, 
and with the duty of revenge upon Smaug. Dwarves take such duties very seriously, and Gandalf saw it. I heard all Thorin's tale, and I thought, well, here is an enemy of Smaug at any rate, and one worthy of help. I must do what I can. I should have thought of dwarves before. I accepted his invitation to his halls in the Blue Mountains. We rested for the night at Bree, and the next day began the journey westwards. We actually passed through the Shire, the land of the hobbits, or halflings, though Thorin would not stop long enough for that to be useful. As far as he was concerned, they were just food growers who happened to work the fields on either side of the dwarves' ancestral road to the mountains. But I had begun to have a warm place in my heart for the Shire folk, since the long winter, 182 years before. They were very hard put to it then, one of the worst pinches they have been in, dying of cold and starving in the dreadful dearth that followed. But that was the time to see their courage and their pity for one another. It was by their pity, as much as by their tough, uncomplaining courage, that they survived. I wanted them still to survive. But I saw that the Westlands were in for another very bad time again, sooner or later, though of quite a different sort. Pitiless war. At that time, Gandalf was beginning to be seriously troubled by the darkness that had crept back into the world. The fall of Moria, the loss of Minas Ithil, and the sickness that had spread through the great Greenwood, now called Mirkwood. This matter was the concern of the White Council, a gathering of the wise elves and wizards of Middle-earth formed to resist the Shadow. Led by Saruman the White, Chief of the Wizards, the Council had met a hundred years prior to determine the true nature of the Necromancer, thought responsible for the corruption that emanated from the dark fortress of Dol Guldur. Saruman had advised that the Necromancer could not be the Dark Lord Sauron, who could never regain his full strength, being separated from the One Ring which was the focus of his power. So high was Saruman's wisdom reckoned at the time that all would believe him, all save Gandalf, who had journeyed deep into Mirkwood and stolen into the fortress of Dol Guldur himself to discover that the necromancer was indeed Sauron, the Lord of the Rings arisen again in disguise. Thus Gandalf had been aware of this greatest threat posed to Middle-earth, and he knew that Sauron was plotting war, intending to attack the West as soon as he felt strong enough, and there was little to prevent committed assault. In those days, the northern regions of Middle-earth were in a perilous state, for the kingdom under the mountain and the strong men of Dale were no more. To resist any force that Sauron might send to regain the northern passes, there were only the dwarves of the Iron Hills, and beside them lay a desolation and a dragon. Smaug would naturally ally with Sauron, and the mountain would be a key strategic advantage. From there, Sauron would use the dragon to terrible effect, regaining the ancient dark kingdom of Angmar in the north, and from there, strike down upon all free folk of the west. It was imperative that any such partnership should be prevented, but our first stroke could not be allowed to go astray. Open war would be swiftly espied by Sauron, and he would not allow any army to take Erebor before him. I was as eager as Thorin to see the end of the dragon, but he was all for plans of battle and war, as if he were really King Thorin II, and I could see no hope in that. Indeed, I think it was annoyance with his pride and haughty disregard of the hobbits that first put into my head the idea of entangling him with them. So I left him for a time, and went off into the Shire, and picked up the threads of news. 
Although I had been away from it for more than 20 years, I knew the country well, along with some of its people. Somehow I had been attracted by one of the hobbits long before, as a child and a young hobbit. He had not quite come of age when I had last seen him. Yet he had stayed in my mind ever since, with his eagerness and his bright eyes, and his love of tales, and his questions about the wide world. As soon as I entered the Shire, I heard news of him. He was getting talked about, it seemed. Both his parents had died early for Shire folk, at about eighty, and he had never married. He was already growing a bit queer, they said, and went off for days by himself. He could be seen talking to strangers, even dwarves. <laughs> even dwarves? Suddenly, in my mind, these three things came together. The great dragon with his lust and his keen hearing and scent. The sturdy, heavy-booted dwarves with their old burning grudge. And the quick, soft-footed hobbit. Sick at heart, I guessed, for a sight of the wide world. I laughed at myself, but I went off at once to have a look at him, to see what twenty years had done, and whether he was as promising as gossip seemed to make out. But he was not at home. They shook their heads in Hobbiton when I asked after him. Oh, off again, said one hobbit. It was Holman, the gardener, I believe. Off again. He'll go right off one of these days if he isn't careful. Why, I asked him where he was going and when he would be back, and I don't know, he says. And then he looks at me queerly. It depends if I meet any, Holman, he says. It's the Elves' New Year tomorrow. Oh, a pity. And him so kind a body, you wouldn't find a better from the downs to the river. Oh, better and better, I thought. I think I shall risk it. Time was getting short. I had to be with the White Council in August at the latest, or Saruman would have his way and nothing would be done. And quite apart from greater matters, that might prove fatal to the quest. The power in Dol Guldur would not leave any attempt on Erebor unhindered unless he had something else to deal with. So I rode off back to Thorin in haste, to tackle the difficult task of persuading him to put aside his lofty designs, and go secretly, and take a hobbit with him. Riding to the Blue Mountains west of the Shire, Gandalf found Thorin in his halls, in conclave with some of his folk. Balin and Glowin were there, and several others. Well, what have you got to say? Asked Thorin as soon as Gandalf came in. This first, answered Gandalf. Your own ideas are those of a king, Thorin Oakenshield, but your kingdom is gone. If it is to be restored, which I doubt, it must be from small beginnings. Far away here, I wonder if you fully realize the strength of a great dragon. But that is not all. There is a shadow growing fast in the world far more terrible. They will help each other. Open war would be quite useless, and anyway, it is impossible for you to arrange it. You will have to try something simpler, and yet bolder. Indeed, something desperate. You are both vague and disquieting, said Thorin. Speak more plainly. Well, for one thing, said Gandalf, you will have to go on this quest yourself, and you will have to go secretly. No messengers, heralds, or challenges for you, Thorin Oakenshield. At most, you can take with you a few kinsmen or faithful followers, but you will need something more, something unexpected. Name it, said Thorin. One moment, answered Gandalf. You hope to deal with a dragon, and he is not only very great, but he is now also old and very cunning. From the beginning of your adventure, you must allow for this. His memory and his sense of smell. Naturally, said Thorin. Dwarves have had more dealings with dragons than most, and you are not instructing the ignorant. Very good, answered Gandalf. But your own plans did not seem to me to consider this point. My plan is one of stealth. Stealth. 
also a scent that cannot be placed, at least not by Smaug, the enemy of dwarves. Smaug does not lie on his costly bed without dreams, Thorin Oakenshield. He dreams of dwarves. You may be sure that he explores his hall day by day, night by night, until he is sure that no faintest air of a dwarf is near, before he goes to his sleep, his half-sleep, prick-eared for the sound of dwarf feet. You make your stealth sound as difficult and hopeless as any open attack, said Balin. Impossibly difficult. Yes, it is difficult, answered Gandalf. But not impossibly difficult, or I would not waste my time here. I would say absurdly difficult. So I am going to suggest an absurd solution to the problem. Take a hobbit with you. Smaug has probably never heard of hobbits, and he has certainly never smelt them. A what? cried Glowin. One of those Simmeldons down in the Shire? What use on earth or under it could he possibly be? Let him smell as he may, he would never dare to come within smelling distance of the nakedest dragon net new from the shell. But now, now, said Gandalf, that is quite unfair. You do not know much about the Shire folk, Glowin. I suppose you think them simple, because they are generous and do not haggle, and think them timid, because you never sell them any weapons. You are mistaken. Anyway, there is one that I have my eye on as a companion for you, Thorin. He is neat banded and clever, though shrewd and far from rash, and I think he has courage. Great courage, I guess, according to the way of his people. They are, you might say, brave at a pinch. You have to put these hobbits in a tight place before you find out what is in them. The test cannot be made, Thorin answered. As far as I've observed, they do all they can to avoid tight places. Quite true, said Gandalf. They are a very sensible people. But this hobbit is rather unusual. I think he could be persuaded to go into a tight place. I believe that in his heart he really desires to. To have, as he would put it, an adventure. Not at my expense, said Thorin, rising and striding about angrily. This is not advice, this is foolery. I fail to see what any hobbit, good or bad, could do that would repay me for a day's keep, even if he could be persuaded to start. Fail to see? You would fail to hear it, more likely, answered Gandalf. Hobbits move without effort more quietly than any dwarf in the world could manage, though his life depended on it. They are, I suppose, the most soft-footed of all mortal kinds. You do not seem to have observed that at any rate, Thorin Oakenshield, as you romped through the Shire, making a noise, I may say, that the inhabitants could hear a mile away. When I said that you would need stealth, I meant it. Professional stealth. Professional stealth? cried Balin taking up his words rather differently than he had meant them. Do you mean a trained treasure seeker? Can they still be found? Gandalf hesitated. This was a new turn, and he was not sure how to take it. (sighs) I think so, he said at last. For a reward, they will go in where you dare not, or at any rate cannot, and get what you desire. Thorin's eyes glistened as the memories of lost treasures moved in his mind. But... Mm. A paid thief, you mean, he said scornfully. Mm -hmm. That might be considered if the reward was not too high. But what has all this got to do with one of those villagers? They drink out of clay, and they cannot tell a gem from a bead of glass. I wish you would not always speak so confidently without knowledge, said Gandalf sharply. These villagers have lived in the Shire some 1,400 years, and they have learned many things in the time. They had dealings with the elves and with the dwarves a thousand years before Smaug came to Erebor. None of them are wealthy as your forefathers reckoned it, but you will find some of their dwellings have fairer things in them than you can boast here, Thorin. The hobbit that I have in mind has ornaments of gold and eats with silver tools and drinks wine out of shapely crystal. Ah, I see her drift at last, said Balin. He is a thief, then. That is why you recommend him. At that, Gandalf lost his temper and his caution. He saw a dwarvish conceit that no one can have or make anything of value save themselves, 
and that all fine things in other hands must have been got, if not stolen, from the dwarves at some time. And it was more than he could stand at that moment. Ha! A thief! He said, laughing. Why, as a professional thief, of course. How else would a hobbit come by a silver spoon? I will put the thief's mark on the door, and then you will find it. Then being angry, Gandalf got up and said with a warmth that surprised even himself. You must look for that door, Thorin Oakenshield. I am serious. And suddenly, Gandalf felt that he was indeed in hot earnest. This queer notion was not a joke, it was right. It was desperately important that it should be carried out, and the dwarves must bend their stiff necks. Listen to me, Durin's folk! Gandalf cried. If you persuade this hobbit to join you, you will succeed. If you do not, you will fail. If you refuse even to try, then I have finished with you. You will get no more advice or help from me until the shadow falls on you. Thorin turned and looked at him in astonishment. Strong words, he said. Very well, I will come. Some foresight is on you, if you are not merely crazed. Good, said Gandalf. But you must come with good will, not merely in the hope of proving me a fool. You must be patient and not easily put off if neither the courage nor the desire for adventure that I speak of are plain to see at first sight. He will deny them. He will try to back out. But you must not let him. Haggling will not help him, if that is what you mean, said Thorin. I will offer him a fair reward for anything that he recovers, and no more. It was not what Gandalf had meant, but it seemed to him useless to say so. There is one other thing, he went on. You must make all your plans and preparations beforehand. Get everything ready. Once persuaded, he must have no time for second thoughts. You must go straight from the Shire, east to your quest. He sounds a very strange creature, this thief of yours, said a young dwarf called Feely, Thorin's nephew. What is his name, or the one that he uses? Hobbits use their real names, said Gandalf. The only one that he has is Bilbo Baggins. <laughs> what a name, said Feely, and <laughs> laughed. Oh, he thinks it very respectable, said Gandalf. And it fits well enough, for he is a middle-aged bachelor, and getting a bit flabby and fat. Food is perhaps at present his main interest. He keeps a very good larder, I'm told, and maybe more than one. At least you will be well entertained. Oh, that is enough, said Thorin. If I had not given my word, I would not come now. I'm in no mood to be made a fool of, for I am serious also. Deadly serious, and my heart is hot within me. Gandalf took no notice of this. Look now, Thorin, he said. April is passing and spring is here. Make everything ready as soon as you can. I have some business to do, but I shall be back in a week. When I return, if all is in order, I will ride on ahead to prepare the ground. Then we will all visit him together on the following day. And with that, Gandalf took his leave, not wishing to give Thorin more chance of second thoughts than Bilbo was to have. The rest of the story has been told in other places, from Bilbo's point of view. If the account had been written by Gandalf, it would have sounded rather different. It was on the morning of Tuesday, April the 25th, 2941, that I called to see Bilbo. And though I knew more or less what to expect, I must say that my confidence was shaken. For Bilbo had changed, of course. At least he was getting rather greedy and fat and his old desires had dwindled down to a sort of private dream. Nothing could have been more dismaying than to find it actually in danger of coming true. I saw that things would be far more difficult than I had thought, but I persevered. Bilbo did not know all that went on. The care, for instance, that I took so that the coming of a large party of dwarves to Bywater, off the main road and their usual beat, should not come to his ears too soon. Next day, Wednesday, April the 26th, I brought Thorin and his companions to Bag End. With great difficulty, as far as Thorin was concerned, he hung back at the last. Everything, in fact, went extremely badly for me from the beginning. 
and that unfortunate business about the professional thief, which the dwarves had got firmly in their heads, only made matters worse. And of course Bilbo was completely bewildered and behaved ridiculously. He made a complete fool of himself. For one thing, he did not realize at all how fatuous the dwarves thought him, nor how angry they were with me. Thorin was contemptuous from the beginning, and thought then that I had planned the whole affair simply so as to make a mock of him. He was much more indignant than Bilbo perceived, and would have left in rage, but for another strange chance, which I will mention in a moment. I was thankful that I had said we should all stay the night at Bag End, since we should need time to discuss ways and means. It gave me a last chance. If Thorin had left before I could see him alone, my plan would have been ruined. It was only the map and the key that saved the situation. But I had not thought of them for years. It was not until I got to the Shire and had time to reflect on Thorin's tale that I suddenly remembered the strange chance that had put them in my hands, and it began now to look less like chance. I remembered a dangerous journey of mine, 91 years before, when I had entered Dol Guldur in disguise, and had found there an unhappy dwarf dying in the pits. I had no idea who he was. He had a map that had belonged to Durin's folk in Moria, and a key that seemed to go with it, though he was too far gone to explain it. And he said that he had possessed a great ring. Nearly all his ravings were of that. The last of the seven, he said over and over again. But all these things he might have come by in many ways. He might have been a messenger caught as he fled, or even a thief trapped by a greater thief. But he gave the map and the key to me. For my son, he said. And then he died. And soon after I escaped myself, I stowed the things away, and by some warning of my heart, I kept them always with me. Safe, but soon almost forgotten. I had other business in Dol Guldur more important and perilous than all the treasure of Erebor. Now I remembered it all again, and it seemed clear that I had heard the last words of Thryon the Second, though he did not name himself or his son. And Thorin, of course, did not know what had become of his father, nor did he even mention the last of the Seven Rings. This ring was believed by Durin's folk to be the first of the seven that was forged, given to King Durin III by the elven smiths themselves and not by Sauron, though doubtless his evil power was on it, since he had aided in the forging of all the seven. But the possessors of the ring did not display it or speak of it, and they seldom surrendered it until near death. But it may well be that Sauron, by his arts, had discovered who had this ring, the last to remain free, and that the singular misfortunes of the heirs of Durin were largely due to his malice. For the dwarves had proved untamable by this means. The only power over them that the rings wielded was to inflame their hearts with the greed of gold and precious things, so that if they lacked them, all other good things seemed profitless. Though they could be slain or broken, they could not be reduced to shadows enslaved to another will. All the more did Sauron hate the possessors and desire to dispossess them. It was nine years after Thryon had left his people that I found him and he had then been in the pits of Dol Guldur for five years at least. I did not know how he endured so long, nor how he had kept these things hidden through all his torments. I think that the Dark Power had desired nothing from him except the ring only, and when he had taken that, he troubled no further, but just flung the broken prisoner into the pits to rave until he died. A small oversight but it proved fatal. Small oversights often do. 
I had the plan and the key of the secret entrance to Erebor, by which Thror and Thryan escaped from Smau, according to Thorin's tale. And I had kept them, though without any design of my own, until the moment when they would prove most useful. Fortunately, I did not make any mistake in my use of them. I kept them up my sleeve until things looked quite hopeless. As soon as Thorin saw them, he really made up his mind to follow my plan, as far as a secret expedition went at any rate. Whatever he thought of Bilbo, he would have set out himself. The existence of a secret door, only discoverable by dwarves, made it seem at least possible to find out something of the dragon's doings, perhaps even to recover some gold or some heirloom to ease his heart's longings. But that was not enough for me. I knew in my heart that Bilbo must go with him, or the whole quest would be a failure. So I had still to persuade Thorin to take him. There were many difficulties on the road afterwards, but for me this was the most difficult part of the whole affair. Though I argued with him far into the night after Bilbo had retired, it was not finally settled until early the next morning. Thorin was suspicious. He is soft, he snorted, soft as the mud of his shire, and silly. You are playing some crooked game of your own, Master Gandalf. I am sure that you have other purposes than helping me. You are quite right, I said. If I had no other purposes, I should not be helping you at all. Great as your affairs may seem to you, they are only a small strand in the great web. I am concerned with many strands. But that should make my advice more weighty, not less. I know your fame, Thorin answered. I hope it is merited. So many cares may have disordered your wits. <sighs> there have certainly been enough to do so, I said. And among them I find most exasperating a proud dwarf who seeks advice from me without claim on me that I know, and then rewards me with insolence. Go your own ways, Thorin Oakenshield, if you will. But if you flout my advice, you will walk to disaster and curb your pride and your greed, or you will fall at the end of whatever path you take, though your hands be full of gold. He blenched a little at that, but his eyes smoldered. Do not threaten me, he said. I will use my own judgment in this matter, as in all that concerns me. <laughs> do so then. I can say no more, unless it is this. I do not give my love or trust lightly, Thorin, but I am fond of this hobbit, and wish him well. Treat him well, and you shall have my friendship till the end of your days. I said that without hope of persuading him, but I could have said nothing better. Dwarves understand devotion to friends, and gratitude to those who help them. Very well. Thorin said at last, after a silence, He shall set out with my company. If he dares, which I doubt. But if you insist on burdening me with him, you must come too, and look after your darling. <sighs> Good, I answered. I will come, and stay with you as long as I can, at least until you have discovered his worth. From the unexpected party, there followed many deeds and events of great moment, including the finding of the One Ring. In the dark tunnels under the Goblin's realm, it had seemed unremarkable to Bilbo at first. Yet it was evidently a magical ring, for it made him invisible and allowed his escape from the creature Gollum. The ring was used to great effect in Bilbo's adventures to the mountain but he kept it secret for as long as he could, even from Thorin's company and Gandalf. After the successful quest of Erebor, he brought it back to the Shire, where it remained with him for 60 years, until his 111th birthday. Then he left it to his nephew and appointed heir Frodo. And thus, Frodo Baggins became the ring bearer. This ring, however, was no trinket or frivolous trick of invisibility. 
It was the One Ring, forged by the Dark Lord Sauron himself in the fires of Mount Doom in the land of Mordor. It was the Master Ring, and in it was bound all his power and malice, enough to poison the mind of any other who long possessed it. And now he sought it above all else, for if it were to return to his hand, his full strength would be restored, enough to cover all the lands in shadow. For 17 years, Frodo kept the ring locked away, but Sauron had discovered that it lay in the Shire. Gandalf was again aware of him, and warned Frodo that the ring must be taken away to be destroyed, so that a final end of Sauron might be achieved. Frodo left the Shire with three of his closest friends, the hobbits Samwise, Meriadoc, and Peregrine. They made it to Rivendell, where at a great council of all the free folk united against Sauron, it was decided to take the ring by stealth into Mordor, the only place it could be unmade. From Rivendell, the Fellowship of the Ring set out east, but perils over the edge of the wild diverted their course. They were forced underneath the misty mountains, and there, in the ancient halls of Durin's folk, encountered the terror in Moria. A thing of dread awoken from long slumber, wreathed in shadow and flame. Eight of the company managed to escape into Lorien, but Gandalf remained behind and challenged it, battling for many days through fire and death, until finally he claimed the victory and recovered to new power, becoming Gandalf the White, the greatest of the wizards of Middle-earth. And so Durin's Bane was defeated, and Moria made free of that terror. This was the year of the War of the Ring. The great captains and armies of the West battled against the Shadow, guided by the tireless deeds of Gandalf. Meanwhile, the Ring was borne by dark roads and secret ways into the heart of Sauron's realm. Yet, by a strange chance at the final stroke, it was doomed by one who had long yearned to protect it for himself. It was by the enduring, twisted desire to reclaim his precious, that Gollum, in his madness, fell with the ring into the fires of Mount Doom and perished along with the One. Thus, it was by the pity of the chosen and selected Bilbo in the Goblin Tunnels that Gollum had survived to deliver the victory at the last moment the final downfall of Sauron. And so the West defeated the shadow of Mordor, and the kingship in Gondor was restored. And thus began the new age in Middle-earth. Many therefore have supposed that Gandalf foresaw all these things, and chose his time for the meeting with Thorin. Yet it is believed that this was not so. When the War of the Ring was over, Gandalf spoke himself about the unlikely chances that had set the wheels of victory in motion. It was after the crowning of King Elessar, and Gandalf the White stayed in a fair house in Minas Tirith, along with other members of the Fellowship of the Ring. Frodo Baggins was there, alongside his companions Peregrine and Meriadoc, as well as the dwarf Gimli, son of that Glowin who accompanied Thorin Oakenshield. Gandalf was very merry, and though the party asked him questions about all that came into their minds, his patience seemed as endless as his knowledge, and he told them much more than they could recall, and often things they did not understand. On a time, Gimli said to Peregrine, 
There is a thing I must do one of these days. I must visit that shire of yours. Not to see more hobbits. I doubt if I could learn anything about them that I do not know already. But no dwarf of the house of Durin could fail to look with wonder on that land. Did not the recovery of the kinship under the mountain and the fall of Smaug begin there? Not to mention the end of Sauron and Barad-dûr, though both were strangely woven together. Strangely. Very strangely. He said, and paused. Then, looking hard at Gandalf, he went on. But who wove the web? I do not think I have ever considered that before. Did you plan all this then, Gandalf? If not, why did you lead Thorin Oakenshield to such an unlikely door? To find the ring and bring it far away into the west for hiding, and then to choose the ring bearer, and to restore the mountain kingdom as a mere deed by the way? Was that not your design? Gandalf did not answer at once. He stood up and looked out of the window, west, seawards and the sun was then setting, and a glow was in his face. He stood so a long while silent. But at last he turned to Gimli and said, I do not know the answer, for I have changed since those days, and I am no longer trammeled by the burden of Middle-earth as I was then. In those days I should have answered you with words like those I used to Frodo, only last year in the spring. <laughs> only last year. But such measures are meaningless. In that far distant time I said to a small and frightened hobbit, Bilbo was meant to find the ring, and not by its maker, and you therefore were meant to bear it. And I might have added, and I was meant to guide you both to those points. To do that I used in my waking mind only such means as were allowed to me, doing what lay to my hand according to such reasons as I had. Then Frodo said, I understand you a little better today, Gandalf, than I did before. Though I suppose that, whether meant or not, Bilbo might have refused to leave home. And so might I. You could not compel us. You were not even allowed to try. But I am still curious to know why you did what you did, as you were then an old grey man as you seemed. I was very troubled at that time. I knew that Sauron had arisen again in Dol Guldur and was preparing for a great war. But how would he begin? Would he try first to reoccupy Mordor? Or would he first attack the chief strongholds of his enemies? I thought then, and I am sure now, that to attack Lorien and Rivendell as soon as he was strong enough was his original plan. It would have been a much better plan for him, and much worse for us. Often I said to myself, I must find some means of dealing with Smaug, but a direct stroke against Dol Guldur is needed still more. We must disturb Sauron's plans. I must make the Council see that. That is why, to jump forward, I went off as soon as the expedition against Smaug was well started, and persuaded the Council to attack first, before Sauron attacked Lorien. Sauron, for the last time, aided the Council, for he had begun to see Sauron as a challenger to his own pursuit for the One Ring and we put forth our strength and assailed Dol Guldur, and drove Sauron from his hold. Yet he was always ahead of us in his plans. I must confess that I thought he really had retreated again, and that we might have another spell of watchful peace. But it did not last long. Sauron decided to take the next step. He returned at once to Mordor, and in ten years he declared himself and then everything grew dark. Yet that was not his original plan, and it was in the end a mistake, 
Resistance still had somewhere where it could take counsel free of the shadow. How could the Ringbearer have escaped if there had been no Lorien or Rivendell? And those places might have fallen, I think, if Sauron had thrown all his power against them first and not spent more than half of it in the assault on Gondor. Well, there you have it. That was my chief reason. But it is one thing to see what needs doing, and quite another to find the means. As for the Shire Folk in the years before the quest, I knew they were made of stronger stuff than most would believe. But to come through, I thought they would need something more than they now had. It is not easy to say what. They had begun to forget, forget their own beginnings and legends, forget what little they had known about the greatness of the world. It was not yet gone, but it was getting buried, the memory of the high and the perilous. But you cannot teach that sort of thing to a whole people quickly. There was not time. And anyway, you must begin at some point with some one person. I dare say he was chosen, and I was only chosen to choose him. But I picked out Bilbo. Uh, now, that's just what I want to know, said Peregrine. How did you do that? <laughs> How would you select any one hobbit for such a purpose? I had not time to sort them all out, but thinking over the hobbits that I knew, I said to myself, I want a dash of the toque, oh, uh, well, but not too much, Master Peregrine. <laughs> <laughs> and I want a good foundation of the stolid sort, a Baggins, perhaps. That pointed at once to Bilbo, and I had known him once very well, almost up to his coming of age, better than he knew me. I liked him then, and now I found that he was unattached, and had never married. I thought that odd, though I guessed why it was, and the reason that I guessed was not the one that most of the hobbits gave me, that he had early been left very well off and his own master. No, I guessed that he wanted to remain unattached for some reason deep down which he did not understand himself, or would not acknowledge, for it alarmed him. I remembered how he used to pester me with questions when he was a youngster, about the hobbits that had occasionally gone off, as they said in the Shire. There were at least two of his uncles on the Took side that had done so. He wanted to be free to go when the chance came, or he had made up his courage. The rest of the story is well known to you. I do not suppose that when the quest of Arabor set out, Thorin had any real hope of destroying Smaug. There was no hope, yet it happened. But alas, Thorin did not live to enjoy his triumph or his treasure. Pride and greed overcame him, in spite of my warning. But surely, said Frodo, he might have fallen in battle anyway. There would have been an attack of orcs, however generous Thorin had been with his treasure. That is true said Gandalf. Poor Thorin. He was a great dwarf of a great house, whatever his faults. And though he fell at the end of the journey, it was largely due to him that the kingdom under the mountain was restored. But Dian Ironfoot was a worthy successor. And now we hear that he fell, fighting before Erebor again, even while we fought here on the edges of Mordor. I should call it a heavy loss, if it was not a wonder, rather, that in his great age he could still wield his axe as mightily as they say he did, standing over the body of King Brand before the gate of Erebor until the darkness fell. When you think of the great battle of Pelennor, do not forget the battle of Dale. It might all have gone very differently indeed if King Dain and King Brand had not stood. Think of what might have been. Dragon fire and savage swords in Eriador. We might now only hope to return from the victory here to ruin and ash. <sighs> the 
that has been averted. Because I met Thorin Oakenshield one evening on the edge of spring not far from Bree. <laughs> A chance meeting, as we say in Middle Earth. Well, Gimli laughed. <laughs> uh, it still sounds absurd, he said. Even now that all has turned out more than well. I knew Thorin, of course, and I wish I had been there. But I was away at the time of your first visit to us, and I was not allowed to go on the quest. Too young, they said, though at 62 I thought myself fit for anything. Well, I'm glad to have heard the full tale. If it is full, I do not really suppose that even now you are telling us all you know. <laughs> all that I know? Of course not, said Gandalf. But what I knew in my heart, or knew before I stepped on these grey shores, that is another matter. O Loren, I was in the West that is forgotten, and only to those who are there, or may perhaps return thither with me, shall I say more. And so it was that four years afterwards, Gandalf the White departed from Middle-earth and sailed across sea into the west. With him went Elrond and Galadriel of the White Council and Frodo the Ring-Bearer. And on that ship went also Bilbo Baggins. The Burglar and Ring Finder, Elf Friend and Companion of Dwarves. And it would be his last adventure told of in Middle-earth. <laughs>